Good morning and hello and welcome to AI in Enterprise, an online series of enterprise-focused talks with leaders in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I'm Sarah Fleiss. I am a senior lecturer in the finance unit at Harvard Business School, um, and I have a background in investing. So I'm really actually interested at the moment in the intersection of fintech and machine learning and in with investment management. So I am super excited to be here this morning um, and to learn together. So this is the sixth month of the AI and enterprise series, and it aims to provide key insights on how enterprise firms are thinking strategically and thoughtfully about AI integration. Successful adaption programs need to, adoption programs need to be developed to actually fit the specific needs of an organization from its data strategy, product management, product development, to the engagement with the cloud, partners, and customers. And the goal here today is to equip today's executive and senior decision makers with the tools and knowledge to actually transition their AI to larger, more established organizations. So for today, we're gonna to focus on FinTech and looking at two very different solutions using AI and machine learning to change the landscape of the financial services industry. So I'm very excited to be here. And I, um, before we formally introduce them, I just wanna say thank you to Saroop and Greg for being here. Um, we're really excited to have you. So just a couple housekeeping items before we launch into today's session. So first, please mute your microphones. Everybody should be muted, but if you are not, I would love for you to do that now. That does not mean that we don't wanna hear from you. So please, please, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat and hopefully I can inv include them um, as we talk to Saroop and Greg today. Um, as Jenny said, we are recording this session both by video and later as a podcast, um, and you will be able to see it on the Lish YouTube channel as well as on you know, lots of podcast platforms. Um, this is part of a series and really part of a community, this event. Um, so realize that the dialogue does not stop today. Um, and so we hope that you will also join the AI and Enterprise Slack community where you can hear um, and see all the different materials that you're gonna see today, that you can also get other materials from the Lish Center, um, as well as hear about other events that are happening and register for them. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of shout out for the event that is happening next, which is on February, I think 17th. Um, Mohamed El Gaish is the director at Cisco is going to speak about using AI technology for optimizing customer service. So there's more of these events um, and please just continue to be part of this community. Okay, so I'm really, really excited to have Saroop and Greg here today, and I just want to give them a quick introduction before I give them a little bit of time to really walk through their journey with us. So Saroop Barwani is a serial tech entrepreneur. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Senso, which actually uses the power of AI to increase customer retention and profitability at financial services firms. So he really helps financial services firms really better understand the customers that they have and how they are going to uh, behave. So it's gonna be pretty cool to, to work, see what he's doing. Um, Greg Wolf, who can probably wave, um, has more than 20 years of experience as an entrepreneur and really is a leader in the fintech space. So he is the founder and CEO of Fiverty, um, which is an AI solution for cyber fraud um, and threat intelligence. And Greg founded the Boston AI Think Tank, which is a group of senior executives, both on the financial services side as in institutions, as well as government agencies to really think through how AI can improve financial crime detection. Um, he, I think it's pretty cool, advised the US Congress on how AI can improve financial crime detection and was actually included as part of the 2019 bill to, moder to modernize anti-laundering, anti-money laundering. Um, and so he was awarded the IT CEO of the year by AI Global Magazine and the FinTech Innovation winner by the Financial Information Management Association. So Greg and Saroop, we are so excited to have you here. As you can see, they're gonna share with us two very different solutions for the financial services industry. Um, and we're gonna hear from them right now about sort of their journey from their insight to their technology to turning it into a commercialized product. So I am going to turn it over first to Saroop, um, who's just going to um, lead us off with some of his thoughts. Thanks. Great. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Can, can everyone see that? Great. 
So uh, first off, uh, Jenny, Sarah, and the rest of the HBS community, thank you so much for having me back this year uh, virtually. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and always have fun doing these uh, events. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about Senso and our journey, but, but really want to give everyone a sense of real use cases that we're applying, leveraging uh, machine learning, um, and how our end, end users uh, within these financial institutions are getting benefit out of it but how it's also benefiting consumers as well. Um, and we really leverage financial institutions as a conduit to benefit consumers in the masses by providing them with better experiences using predictive technology and great UX. Um, so a little bit about Senso and who we are. Uh, company was founded in 2017. We were born in the heart of the Toronto tech community and we're really backed by uh, Boston and Silicon Valley. That makes up a majority of our uh, venture capitalists that, that are on our cap table. Um, and the founders, myself and Nick Seeler, to have a background in the intersection of AI, that's Nick, and user experience, that's myself. Um, our focus is really, you know, targeting banks who really want to provide consumer experiences similar to fintechs uh, and big tech companies. And uh, our go-to-market focus is on the mortgage servicing uh, industry, which is fairly traditional and um, really, really could use an enhancement uh, in tech. And, and there's a huge wave of tech pouring into that industry. But the metrics, the core metrics around retention are still pretty subpar. And, and that's really what we're solving. Um, so what we do is we enable financial institutions and mortgage servicers to empower consumers with contextual and connected micro interactions resulting in unparalleled service. Um, so uh, really kind of want to dive into a concept that I've talked about a lot um, over the last half decade and the concept of micro interactions. And in order to demonstrate what a micro interaction is, um, and I wish I could ask the audience, you know, when they've felt these types of experiences, but I want to provide you with a couple of examples. So one is, you know, we have, we've all used Uber before, and I always ask the question, you know, when you used Uber for the first time, when was that moment that you actually felt that you would never go back to a taxi? Um, you know, it could be that, that not having to hail, um, for me, it was when I walked out of that Uber and I just didn't have to do it. I didn't have to pay because it was automated for me. That embedded experience of financial services was just so pleasurable to me that I was happy to tip that driver and it made the driver happy and it sort of created this virtual cycle that, you know, the cab, the cab industry just couldn't compete with. Um, so another example of an aha moment, this micro interaction is I just bought a, a Peloton bike um, for my wife, actually, uh, who's, who's eight months pregnant. It was like, you got to buy a Peloton bike. And I looked up the price tag of like, you know, $2,400. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. But a firm allowed me to actually pay for it in $63 installments on a monthly basis at 0% APR. And it was integrated into the experience. Again, that aha moment that made me feel that I could do something that I couldn't do before with, you know, a traditional financial institution. So these are a couple of examples of what I get excited about in terms of what we're creating in this concept of micro interactions. And there are many examples of this. Two, uh, two individuals that I would encourage everybody to, to, to read about and look into is Angela Strange, who talks a lot about how every company is becoming a fintech company. Uber is an example of that with their integrated payments. Um, and then Matt Harris from Bain, who really talks about this concept of embedded finance. Um, and really, I would encourage you to, to, to read up on this because it's a huge wave that we're just in the, the first half of the first inning of, of this wave. So we'd really encourage you and hopefully um, we're sharing these slides after so everybody can kind of get the references. So the, the bottom line, you know, from a consumer perspective, you know, consumers are seeking financial experiences and banks are investing to catch up. So this was a study done by Plaid. And again, you know, please go to the link to get a more comprehensive view. But people are looking to fintechs as the new normal for managing money. I think we all know this intuitively and we're all doing it, but it's real. Everybody is, is making the shift towards better experiences and micro interactions. And the top strategic priorities for, for FIs now in 2020 is improving those digital experiences, is enhancing those data and analytics capabilities and, and reducing operating costs amongst many other things. But the top of the list is providing better digital experiences. And post COVID, I think every company is accelerating their pace of digital transformation. The reason why we focused on the mortgage industry is um, for a couple of reasons. Um, 
retention in the mortgage industry has always been extremely low on average about 20 percent as you can see it's it's it, it, it's it was a wave of improvement due to the interest rate environments but right now it's still sitting at that low low mark of under 20 percent and um with the surge of uh, refinances due to low interest rates, and and that doesn't seem to be you know changing anytime soon. The need for micro interactions and you to engage consumers with great experiences is more needed than ever in this industry. And you know we've seen a like a pour of demand in this industry, particularly in the U.S. market. So our product is focused on enhancing these micro interactions and these moments for consumers when when they need service. And, you know, if with a bank with like millions and millions of consumers, you really need to prioritize who you focus on at the right time and, and how to interact with them. And so we've introduced a, a product to the market called the Senso Score um, in, in collaboration with TransUnion Global. And it's a predictive scoring and audience prioritization um, uh, analytic that allows you to predict behavior six months in advance. So is someone gonna close their account? Are they gonna churn? Are they gonna require service or accept a product? That's sort of the dimensions of what we predict very, very accurately. And then we embed these uh, predictions into digital interactions. So we're targeting the right customer at the right time with contextual micro interactions, which drive conversion lift, but also help consumers really get the service that they demand. Um, so providing that FinTech like experience. Uh, an example of a case study is creating that aha moment for mortgage borrowers. And this is, you know, one of many experiments we, we've run. And now a lot of these are in production at scale where, you know, what we found is that people calling into the bank or, uh, or walking into a branch pre-COVID were really having to wait um, for a rate, a revised rate offer. So they would come into the branch or, or the call center and they would say, hey, I want a new rate. Otherwise, I'm going to a competitor. Um, there would usually be a 24 to 40 hour wait time for this at the financial institutions that we worked with. And what we did is we equipped internal teams with predictive technology on who was likely to enter the branch or call. And we actually said, okay, if you're able to equip branch managers and advisors with the rate on hand without zero wait time and target them through digital channels at the same time as nudges, you're providing them an experience where they're not going to go elsewhere because you're proactively approaching that and providing that instant experience and profitability surged as a result of that. And on a portfolio of about 200 billion in mortgages plus a 300 basis point increase means tens of millions of dollars unlocked through one simple interaction change. There's four or five examples of this we've adopted and we've really shifted towards digital channels and providing those really great micro interactions that we've proven really, really surge both profitability and NPS across um, an existing financial institutions consumer base. So um, really, um, we're just getting started. This is the first inning, but we're super excited on where this is going and, and to scale it. So um, that's Senso and, and super excited to have the conversation with all of you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Greg? Great. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just get the screen share going here. Okay. How's that looking? Okay, excellent. Um, once again, thank you, uh, Jenny, Sarah, and, and Harvard uh, for inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, wonderful experience um, to be part of this conversation. And timely too, I think, given what's going on in the world and the markets around AI and machine learning. Um, you know, I think Sarib actually did a great job of kind of outlining where we are um, in the financial services space, um, specifically in digital transformations. And what we found is that, um, you know, especially, I mean, banks are certainly trending towards uh, their digital customer acquisition onboarding process, um, but certainly COVID obviously with remote um, uh, um, the, ability, the inability for people to go into a branch um, made that really pressing. The, the challenge to digital transformation, in fact, the Achilles heel is actually cyber fraud. So um, that's a really good compliment because what we're looking at the same kind of use case, but we're looking at the dark side. Hence, all my slides are dark colors, just to emphasize that, <laughs> okay? Um, <clears throat> so Fiverity. Fiverity is, um, FI stands for Financial Institutions, 
and also stands for fraud intelligence. And verity obviously means veritas, which means truth, um, which is uh, what we're what we're looking to achieve. So we are an AI ML solution for cyber fraud and threat intelligence. <clears throat> Excuse me. And essentially, we're focused on uh, initially a specific uh, use case called synthetic identity fraud or SIF. So synthetic identity fraud um, has been around for a long time, but certainly in the last uh, you know, nine to 12 months, it has gained, gained a ton of momentum. And this is where hackers, um, fraudsters are essentially mining the dark web and they are uh, taking compromised um, identities and combining them together. So maybe Sarah's name, my date of birth and Saroop's social security number or the Canadian equivalent, right? And combining that together and creating these fake persona, and they're using these persona to get up to a ton of nefarious activity um, within financial institutions. And as you can tell from some of these numbers, um, they can do a lot of damage in a very short period of time in terms of defrauding the banks. Um, they're very patient. Uh, they build up these profiles um, at scale. They use um, they generate thousands of these profiles um, using automation techniques. Um, sometimes taking 12 to 18 months. And they look like the perfect customer until they get to a point where they bust out and they basically get as many consumer lending pro products from the bank as they can before disappearing with, the, with having uh, maximized their credit exposure to the bank. So the problem with SIF is that even it's, it's the fastest growing financial fraud, according to the Federal Reserve, 25% growth a year, uh, 2020 uh, credit consumer lending losses, 20% uh, of those uh, losses were cut were a result of stuff costing close to $30 billion to the industry for the year. The real problem is that the rules-based legacy solutions in place, right? And all the banks obviously have tons of, of capabilities, but the rules-based traditional way of, of approaching this problem are just incapable of capturing this type of fraud. 85% um, of SIF, according to the Fed, is being missed by current technology. And keep in mind that SIF is evading, while SIF evades um, detection, it's not just for defrauding the banks, by creating a fake persona, by fabricating an account at a financial institution, they can get up to all types of uh, uh, financial crime like um, money laundering, as Sarah said in the beginning, um, human trafficking, a weapon smuggling, kind of all the worst things that, that, are, that, that people can do. So then enter my favorite subject, which is AI and machine learning. And what we found was that building a machine learning, taking a machine learning approach to this problem turned out to be extremely effective in, in, in uh, detecting and, and uh, identifying SIF. Firstly, it's adaptable, right? If you think about the old rules-based legacy systems, they're constructed by a bunch of if-then statements where people con manually constructing rules to identify this. The forces are evolving way too quickly, and it's actually impossible for people to codify that um, themselves. Instead, machine learning is perfectly uh, capable of being able to adapt to these, these changes uh, in the, in the forces techniques over time as the forces evolve. The second thing is we brought the human into the loop, right, for a number of reasons. Firstly, this is a fraud and cybercrime type of use case. It's really critical to have transparency and have the humans control and understand how they're building this type of capability. And also there's tens of thousands, legions of well-qualified fraud investigators, um, analysts, compliance folks at financial institutions. They have the domain expertise. They're in the trenches on a daily basis fighting the battle against the force. So we thought, let's incorporate the humans into our algorithm with a feedback loop for continuous learning. It evolves over time and it gets better based on, on human interaction. And then one thing that we discovered in our think tank, which I'll get back to in a second, is that there's a strong willingness in the industry to collaborate in the fight against financial crime, crime. not just amongst the institutions themselves, but also to work with the regulators and law enforcement to do a better job. Um, According to the United Nations, um, uh, less than 2% of financial crime is actually prosecuted. And that amounts to trillions of dollars a year and pre presents a significant national security to threat um, to our country and, and, our, and our kind of uh, our friendly nations. So the ability to share intelligence around these types of frauds is, is really critical. The challenge, of course, in financial services is PII or personally identifiable information, data privacy, right? So how do we share the know-how? How do we share the patterns? And how do we share the identities of these known fraudsters broadcasting select collective suspicion through our, through our ecosystem without sharing PII? 
So we built in some capabilities in our technology to share the identities of the fraudsters and the patterns without divulging any PII. And that became a massive enabler in the banking space because they felt comfortable with sharing with their neighbors. So the results have been tremendous. Um, since we've been live in production last year, 40% of the identities that we were able to identify through our, our uh, platform um, were indicated as having slipped through the cracks and essentially incremental on top of the systems they already had in place. So I mean, 40, so it would be naive to assume that we're capturing you know, fraud that the bank wasn't already capturing, right? But 40% of what we were capturing had slipped through all the systems that they had in place, either human or automated and rules-based systems in terms of capturing, mostly because of our ability to share the intelligence across the platform between the institutions, as well as um, the predictive capabilities to learn from the humans. So lastly, um, one of the initiatives that we started when we started the company was um, selling to banks is very challenging, right? And credibility is everything. And we were fortunate in that we pulled together a group of senior executives starting in Boston at the Boston AI think tank. And these senior, senior global head of anti-money laundering, senior executives in risk and compliance um, from some of the brand names, largest financial institutions initially in Boston and now reaching out to, uh, to uh, other parts of the country. And in fact, even in Canada. Um, and what we found was initially was just a dialogue of what is AI and machine learning? What can it do, what it is, and frankly, what it isn't. As an AI ambassador, that was my role to explain to this group. And this is a very senior group who'd seen transformation come through the enterprise many times, cloud, mobile, social. And they looked at AI as a, as a new paradigm and said, what can this do for the industry? And essentially, we really kind of got a lot of a tailwind behind us because there's such a willingness for institutions to share. What we learned from the institutions is that reputational risk is key. It's number one. And having one of their competitors be taken down by another Bernie Madoff reduces confidence in the entire market. So the ability to share and be able to help each other in this kind of fight against financial crime was hugely attractive to these folks, once again, with the ability to maintain their data privacy. And um, as Sarah said in the beginning, we've actually, our think tank had an opportunity to go down to DC. We advised members of the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Com uh, uh, Committee on AI and machine learning and how it could be used to modernize financial services and uh, financial crime detection. The rules in financial services, BSA, Banking Secrecy Act and AML, anti-money laundering are literally 50 years old. In fact, 1970. So last year was the 50th anniversary of those rules. And they're hopelessly antiquated in terms of dealing with the velocity and scale of data today. And the government is aware of that. The regulatory agencies are acutely aware of how the, the, the fraudsters have a, and, the, and the cyber criminals have a, a competitive advantage in being able to leverage modern technology, but the rules for the financial institutions prevent that. So there is change afoot. And uh, we're very fortunate to be, have, to be part of the dialogue working with um, members of Congress, as well as the, uh, the NCUA and the OCC and the Federal Reserve of Bank of Boston, who's a, who's a huge proponent of, of, uh, of, uh, of trying to remedy the SIF problem. And ultimately, FinCEN, who is the Treasury Department's financial services um, enforcement network, are also looking at changing the rules, which to me is a massive sea change and, and super exciting in the industry that everybody's willing to work together and, and find a better way to address this. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Look forward to uh, some of the detailed questions. Awesome. Well, uh, Sarup and Greg, thank you. Um, Greg, I have to say that maybe you should start with dark slides, but it gets positive over the course of the, so maybe they should get lighter. Um, so I would love to really start with the conversation, just talking about what the difference is and even defining machine learning and AI and really talk about the technology piece before we shift to really talking about um, operationalizing and commercializing your products. So, you know, I think people throw out these terms all the time um, and define them differently. So I, I would love for each of you to spend just a short, brief amount of time sort of defining what those terms mean to you. Um, you know, maybe I talk a little bit, a little bit more in depth about the technology piece. Um, and also just you know where your data is coming from and what's unique or special about that. Um, Greg, do you want to lead us off? Because I see your face in front of me. All right, sure, certainly, yeah. So, so you know, I think there's a, a, a kind of a misconception, a preconception, I should say, around AI and machine learning. We like to divide the world into what we call big data AI and scaling the analyst. So I think the traditional 
kind of uh, conception of, of AI is, is what I would call, let's say, Google or Facebook or Amazon type of AI, where basically you take billions of data points, you know, jam them into uh, you know, thousands of hours of core proce processing using a black box algorithm, which only the data scientists understand. And then the computer system comes back and it, quote unquote, tells you something you don't already know, right? So it tells you what's my next stock trade, um, you, know, what, you know, what's my next recommendation for somebody buying another pair of shoes. Right, so that that is, I think, what people generally conceive as uh, as AI. We don't do that. We take a very different approach, and we use machine learning, which I think, when it comes to operationalizing and actually creating a, a sales infrastructure to sell into the financial services space, is a much more pragmatic as, uh, approach. It's it's less conceptual, and it's more around harnessing the know-how of the user, scaling the analyst, taking the knowledge of a a, um, a BSA analyst or a fraud expert. Or, an, or somebody in underwriting and having them teach the system, firstly, control the system by providing transparency, which is possible with machine learning, and then teach the system how to, how to um, improve the algorithm and run the model themselves based part of their daily workflow has proven to be much more effective. Saroop, so, um, do you agree? Like what is, what's been your approach? You know, Greg, I, we, we discussed this in, in the, in the pre-meeting, but I couldn't agree with Greg more. In, in the financial services industry, um, it, it, machine learning is, is the way to go because, you know, it's much, while those, while those enhanced algorithms exist, you know, AI is a very broad concept, right? Um, and I think that when we talk about like Google and Amazon using these algorithms, they're spending just billions of dollars to train, you know, one sophisticated model. We just heard news about Google training a new language model the other day. Realistically, um, that type of investment into something that's going to maybe provide marginal difference is just not the way to go in, 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 in these types of industries where the models need to be somewhat explainable. And really, you just need to kind of be adaptable in the way you operationalize them. So one of the biggest challenges I see in the financial services industry is analytics teams build machine learning models um, and build maybe not predictive models, but they're building models but they're not operationalizing them and leveraging some sort of behavioral feedback loop to, to improve that over time. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an engineer, you know, machine learning is, is nothing new. You know, back when I was in, in school uh, as an engineer, we always talked about, you know, why can't we just give data uh, to a machine and let them learn for themselves? So these concepts of machine learning are, are nothing brand new, but over the last, uh, you know, half decade, we've really seen a, a surge of the amount of data available, um, adoption of the cloud, as well as um, the investment going into this type of technology to actually operationalize it. So I think they're two different things, but you know, artificial intelligence is more broad where machine learning to me is just more practical, practical and applicable in, in an industry like financial services, where there are certain requirements in order to, like, like I mentioned. Awesome. I think both of you brought up the fact that, you know, working in financial services, that that data is um, is very private, that data is often, you know, very guarded. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you've been able to access the data and how you've been able to um, find which data has been useful to you? Sir, Maybe, uh, yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll go first. Yeah, and this is, I mean, you know, starting a company that's data first is is always a, a game of like, you know, testing out a lot of combinations of data to see which one, you know, outperforms another. Um, so, so really, when we started out, it was working with smaller organizations and doing really one off experiments with really smaller organizations who are willing to kind of say, hey, you know, we need some sort of predictability in terms of retargeting our customers or engaging our customers and everything. And the results, you know, weren't that good at the beginning, but as we sort of like, you know, laddered up in our ability to actually show incremental improvement, larger organizations with more data were willing to take a shot into us. That was like literally our first year. Um, after that, you know, we li literally looked to, you know, third party data sets in the markets so for partners that were willing to provide data sets that we could serve the entire market and TransUnion's be been a great partner. Um, all of the data we hold is completely anonymous at the consumer level. And the most powerful moment of our sort of evolution was probably a year and a half in where we joined our first two data sets together um, to the same ID, right? And 
that allowed us to create new data, engineer new features, and that created a whole lot of defensibility, but we saw a huge improvement in our ability to actually produce better results and more insights. The second breakthrough that happened was really when we tested this out end to end in a real world experiment, um, and we were able to get behavioral data to say what worked and what didn't. So that con concept of a confusion matrix and being able to really kind of understand how to improve your models, that's that end to end cycle is, is crucial, right? There's one thing to say, hey, here's the decision you should make, which I think is, is everybody's building these models in a black box, but to say, does it actually work in the real world? And how do we use that to actually make improvements is the part that I think the industry is just starting to tap into. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, you know, firstly, I mean, improving the metrics, right? Having the user be able to validate uh, how effect, the, the efficacy of the system is key. Um, you know, financial services firms are drowning in data. They have plenty data points. And in fact, one of the early learnings we had was, you know, they have like, fraud detection systems. They may have 50 fraud flags that may pop up when somebody applies for a credit card, right? Um, and we didn't want to be that 51st flag, right? Because they, they weren't interested in just getting one more potential piece of friction in the process. Um, by the way, open parens. Uh, you know, some of the, the workflow that we, we've actually been working on is taking a look at our model and using it, not just for the fraud detection, loss prevention side of things, but helping financial institutions um, streamline their new customer onboarding process. Because there's so much friction that's been introduced into the system, um, especially in a remote online environment um, by existing infrastructure. So using the algorithm, not just to look for bad, but also being able to in, identify what is good and in, improve their straight through processing from a revenue perspective is also part of the business model. So little segue there, close parent. Um, but going back to what the, the question around data. So we found that these institutions were so, had so many data points that we looked at our algorithm. And so we bring in data points from the banks themselves and, some, and from some third parties. But what we're finding is that we're almost behaving like a rule of rule systems. Our, our, our customers have many rules based systems in place. What they need is a holistic view of the data, the ability to mimic an analyst and say, okay, I get one flag from this data point and one flag from that data point. Uh, let me really kind of take an overall assessment and scale my know-how to be able to do this, you know, for tens of thousands of applications a week. Um, but, but being able to kind of bring that insight. So overlaying the different pieces of data, I think it has been really critical. We're just rolling out um, what, you know, Saroop said around joining data. I think that's the network effects, the, the wisdom of crowds, um, you know, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, all the analogies really make a lot of sense, especially in the world of machine learning where more data is better. So um, by joining the data together, we're just rolling out our, our, our kind of our multi-party platform and it's going to be very interesting to see some data points in terms of sharing information um, securely, of course, uh, you know, to, be, to achieve some of those kind of real improvements. You know, if we can get if if forty percent of the of the loans, the forty percent of the of the loan applications that we identified of, as fraud had slipped through the cracks on an individual basis, imagine how much more compelling it can be. 60, 70 percent by when we start sharing the data between multiple applications. Um, between multiple customers. And then the last piece, the behavioral piece that Saroop referred to, um, I mean, that is the holy grail, right? When we speak to our, our uh, regulatory partners and we have a partner that actually, um, it, 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 they're called the ncfta.net. And what they do, National Cyber Forensic Training Alliance, what they do is they're a forum to share uh, cyber, uh, cyber intelligence between industry and law enforcement. They have about 14 law enforcement um, partners that they work with, uh, FBI, um, Secret Service, uh, you know, LAPD, NYPD, um, Homeland Security, you know, a, a solid list. And um, what, what, what we found is that through them, um, ultimately looking at the behavioral patterns is going to be the next generation. And I may be getting a little ahead of myself in terms of the last question, but I think moving towards the behavioral piece, taking this data, you know, if we're a rule of rules and abstracting it to a, a, a higher level of science to see insights in the behavior across multiple data points, I think that's a very exciting place and where, where we can all benefit as a society and the banks individually. Awesome. Um, Greg, just to come back to you and some of, and what you talked about at the beginning, um, you talked a little bit about this move away from the if then types of logic more to this AI machine learning based tools. Um, 
Are you worried at all that these bag actors will be able to bypass or be able to respond or react to the tools that you're developing right now? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we don't have the scale in the market where I think the bad actors are looking at us and saying, okay, we've got to, you know, hack that Fiverity tool, I wish we did. Just give us a couple of years to, to kind of grow a little faster and, and we'll get to that point. But that's a really insightful kind of observation because I actually just had this conversation with one of our banking partners this morning. It, essentially what we're doing is, you know, if you look at these, these hackers and these cyber fraudsters, they're automating how they're creating these fake identities. They don't have a person who's sitting and combining names and addresses, right? They're using automation techniques to do this at scale. Example would be, um, there's a couple of guys in Florida who created 7,000 fake identities, populated those under 10 shell companies, back populated years of payroll records and scammed 10 banks out of $3 million worth of PPP loans last year in under 30 days, right? So they're using automation techniques to create these fake, uh, fake identities. And essentially what we're doing is we're trying to mirror those automation techniques and identify the tactics that they're using. So it's almost like the hackers are, are kind of, they're evolving over time and through getting the data from our customers and having our models learn from the analysts as they're recognizing this type of fraud, I almost see us as we're kind of tracking them, right? So I don't think they're kind of reverse hacking us. In fact, we're reverse, reverse. engineering them through the data. So it's so key to have more data and at the same time have that holistic view of the data. No, that's a, that's a, that's a great way of uh, explaining what you guys are doing. Um, just as I look at time, I really want to be able to transition and talk a little bit of the, you know, operationalizing, you know, your models and actually using them as a solution for, for these financial services, um, organizations. So, um, you know, I think one of you brought up the point of, you know, being able to explain your model and not being so black boxish, black boxish. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about like one, that transition, but that two about like, is your model truly a black box or is this something that you, is it really important that you're able to explain it with, to, to these organizations that you're selling it to? Yeah, ab absolutely 100% important that there is a selection process of features that um, is revealed prior to actually productionizing these models. It's actually something that, you know, when we compare the effectiveness of a neural network or a deeper learning model that is more expensive to build, but the fact that it doesn't provide that clarity, um, you know, it, there's no doubt that the, that the cost and the transparency associated with more of the traditional machine learning models, but, but really kind of enhancing those machine learning models to get the most out of them is the way to go in the financial services industry. And I think there are technologies that are revealing um, and being able to explain some of the features in the deeper learning models. But I think that's, that's something that's still in R&D. Right now, what's real is 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 what's needed in the financial services industry, and that is explainability of features and really being able to kind of select which features go into production and really extract the ones that don't meet compliance, right? Especially for a consumer facing uh, model and application. Greg, do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I can just pretty much endorse that. Um, I agree. I think, you know, everybody's obsessed with the deep, deep learning and we certainly have neural networks in our in our kind of pipeline of different uh, things that we apply. Um, you know, once again, when you get away from the big data approach to more of a machine learning approach, um, it's much more tractable, much more explainable, much more transparent. And there's, uh, you know, most of these models come with built-in tools and there's additional capabilities that we've created to identify what kind of transparency to what's driving the models. Mostly so that the consumers, that, I'm sorry, the, the users themselves um, have the ability to kind of affect change and have it modify. So I agree with Sarif on that one. Yeah. And do you guys want to just, I mean, it'd be really helpful for me to hear a little bit about like how you turn these into, you know, how you, how you sell them, how you commercialize them and why, you know, how it is to work with the firms that you're working with to, to evolve the models and evolve the products. Go for it, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I think evolution is actually the, the key word right now for 2021, right? The world is evolving um, from an AI machine learning space, especially given COVID and, and remote. Um, and I think industry um, is really sitting up and paying attention to how technology needs to be leveraged to improve customer experience, loss prevention, you know, rapid onboarding, et cetera. So, 
Um, the, the theme initially for us, there was a lot of education last year and just kind of pointing out that there was a problem. I think there's a lot of awareness around that right now. Um, the, the challenge with an AI and, and rather machine learning model is that um, the model itself is evolving over time and it takes a certain um, specialization and focus you know, just to work on the models rather than kind of being a generalist type of technology firm. So but, uh, firms like us um, uh, need to be, uh, you know, wholly focused on model building and um, focused on a singular use case and, uh, you know, addressing that problem as much as possible. Um, so that I think is like the first criteria for kind of operationalizing and bring this, bring this to the customers and from a sales perspective. Um, Proving out a solid ROI is obviously massively significant. And you know, one good thing, the use case that we chose uh, in fraud is that you know, it falls to the bottom line, right? Every dollar saved is essentially, you know, there's not a lot of costs and that's, you know, doesn't, not a lot of infrastructure around that. It's really just exit profitability. So you know, we've seen ROIs of 10, 12, 15 times, right? So paybacks in less than a month um, once we help our banking partners actually identify that they have this problem. Um, so having a strong ROI is, part of, is, a, is a compelling part. Um, having seamless, uh, frictionless integration into their environment um, is also a significant part of the, of the conversation and making sure we can deploy very easily. Um, and then the last piece I would say is the collaboration piece, um, having the focus of, you know, how can I learn? Initially, we were concerned that folks wouldn't be willing to share the patterns of the fraud and um, the, the identities of the known fraudsters. But more recently, we've heard that folks are saying, you know, I don't want to be part of this kind of collaboration unless I'm going to get the, the learning from everybody else in, in the ecosystem. So I think uh, folks are you know, taking a different look at um, and, and being more open minded. And those are the kind of the key elements that we use when we in our sales process. And just to build off what uh, what Greg mentioned, you know, when you build a model, um, let's say for our use case where it's really kind of identifying which consumers you need to contact and when to provide them better service, you know, the model results just are basically signals. They just provide you with signals. And the biggest feedback we got early on is, yeah, you know what, we have these great signals and they help us prioritize and they're fairly accurate, but what do we do with them? And I think that that's where we found the biggest gap, like the, what do we do with them? And, and you may like, when you look at it outside in, it may seem like a simple problem. Yeah. You just kind of like, just pass them on to your, you know, loan officers and in, in, or contact centers and they call, but it's much more complex, the steps in between that are required to get the most out of the models and the learnings, right? Because what you want to do is you want to run experiments. You want to basically understand an A-B test as much as possible on what works best and what doesn't work best. You know, the example that I'll provide in a real use case is financial institutions often when they have, you know, a portfolio of millions and millions of, of customers, they have call centers and, you know, in like the case of a mortgage, for example, limited capacity for outreach, meaning loan officers can only contact a certain amount of consumers a day. Understanding who they need to contact is really, really important. Um, but being able to leverage digital channels to sort of nurture customers and run nurturing campaigns and, and, and being able to understand what works best requires a lot of A-B testing. And it is that behavioral response data that allows you to analyze and improve so that the next cycle, you're actually doing much better. It actually does something extremely, extremely, something we didn't even expect. But once you have that cycle going, that cycle of improvement, it actually changes the culture within the organization. Now you have people collaborating and all of a sudden kind of discussing on a more frequent basis how to actually um, run better experiments, how to actually serve their customers better. So the ideation and that collaboration from a cultural standpoint is something that makes us most excited. Um, other than our primary focus, which is really kind of helping consumers make better decisions at scale. Yeah, it seems clear to me that this is really a partnership because you need their data, but you really actually need their input more than anything else. Because from where you're coming to really understand the learnings that they have from the customers and from the their their process and their work through. Um, what is the role of regulators in all of this? I mean, we're dealing with financial services industries. We're not, I don't know, it, you know, this is a heavily, heavily regulated industry. Do you need their buy-in from day one or do or can you develop that over time? Is that a big barrier to um, to your business model or for other competitors to come in? 
For my use case, it's like real, real quick. I think it's more applicable for Greg. Like we are contacting consumers and, and as from a marketer standpoint, there's a lot of changes going on from a data pro privacy perspective. And yes, you have to be careful in terms of which consumers you can contact it based on which ones have provided consent. So I think from a consent perspective, that's, that's one side of it. The other side of it, are you predatory in your in your targeting, right? And that's where I go back to being uh, explainable and ensuring that the features you're using doesn't bias towards one population or the other. Those are two considerations we have to take in that workflow prior to actually executing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. On that. And we've and we've created our products, uh, you know, so that it's really it's not a decisioning tool. Um, ultimately, the decisioning is is is. Uh, based on the human input. Um, so we're compliance with the fair Isaac rules and providing transparency, um, you know, gives the reason codes and all the, all the requirements that are necessary to be compliant. Um, so we haven't run into any kind of friction from the regulators. In fact, we've been really pleasantly surprised by their um, interest in pursuing this. Um, I mean, and I see there's a question here about the Fed, FRB, OCC, FINRA, um, pretty much every regulatory state and especially federal um, uh, agency these days has an initiative, uh, an innovation initiative in their environment, right? The reality is they don't know how to do that, right? They're not designed to come up with tech new technology, right? Um, industry struggles with it. Certainly the regulators, it's, it's not their job. So we're finding the regulators are actually extremely open to partnering with us. Um, so for instance, this consortium that we have um, in terms of sharing the intelligence, we have the Federal Reserve Bank participating in that. We have the NCUA participating in that. Uh, we have interest from the OCC and to do a similar thing in the banking space. Uh, we've met with FINRA. Um, you know, I, I find that the regulators are really hungry to learn how to use this technology and put it into production, right? Um, you know, allow it to go you know, in, in a kind of a phased approach uh, as long as they're capable and in the position to define the, the, the bumpers, right? Making sure that this technology behaves itself and doesn't do anything untoward. Um, so we found that, that, that in our experience, the regulators are, are, are really um, interested and motivated to accelerate this type of technology because they know they're falling behind, uh, especially when it comes to cyber fraud and uh, threat intelligence. Yeah, no, it's clear it is a real partnership and that you guys can play a, a really important role. Um, I have sort of two more questions, and then I really would like to spend the remainder of time of really understanding, you know, what's unique about the financial service industry and why, you know, they're not building them themselves, and what, you know, what you, where you where fintech really fits in. But um, two other questions I have really are: first, you know, as you try to operationalize this, does in you, and as you're building out your own businesses, does your funding sources matter, right? As you guys are, you know, building out your own businesses and thinking about who is supporting you. Um, has that been a critical part of your process? I'm an investor, so I'm going to ask you these types of questions too. hundred percent. Like, you know, I, I think our, our, our circle of supporters and backers um, didn't just provide capital and, and, you know, Sarah, you know, you know, some of them that, that are in Boston, um, they've been so valuable and, and so, uh, and in terms of connectivity, um, and just providing us that advice on where to focus because they've done it before. Um, a lot of them have are former operators. Um, I can't emphasize how valuable selecting the right funding sources is in your journey. Yeah. Well, so we're um, I can't say too much because we're about to come out with an announcement in the in the very near future of some good news around our funding. Um, and we, we've been very lucky to attract attention and partner with some folks who really understand. AI machine learning, cyber and financial services and having critical people understand what we're doing who get it, come from industry, um, you know, is, is without a doubt, you know, one of the most significant uh, types of relationships that we can cultivate at this point, um, you know, as, as this evolves because this is a, a tricky landscape and there's a, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, um, uh, obstacles to, to jump over. I'd also talk to our advisors. I think we've been very fortunate as part of this round to actually attract the attention of, of some really significant advisors, um, some, some senior folks from Harvard, I'll just throw that out there, as well as, um, you know, we, we have some folks um, from, uh, you know, former military intelligence, uh, former treasury department. So um, bringing in the right kind of people who understand what we're doing and can make those connections, it has been, it has been really critical and fortunate to have that position. Awesome. No, I think we've done, I think you guys have good talk to 
about sort of the intersection of the technology about in terms of the technology in terms of the partnership with the firms that you're working with um, and then your funding sources and how all three of them have had to work together to sort of bring to bring your products to market and how important that is. Um, I I had a quick question, or I don't, it's not a quick question. It's a real question. Um, I want to understand like why the, why these companies aren't doing this themselves, right? Like as, as Greg, as you said, like this hits their bottom line, right? You know, any customer that, or as Sarup said, as any customer that walks out the door, even though you had a mortgage with them, if they leave, they now need to go spend the time to replace that revenue. So why aren't they doing this themselves? Like, why is the, do you believe that the FinTech, the financial service industry is specifically set up for you guys to really be disruptors in it because they can't build those themselves? Or do you disagree with that? They have big, huge teams of engineers working and they have huge budgets and they act, they really care about these 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 issues absolutely i'll i'll go first on this one so so you know i had two different perspectives before starting senso one having started and scaled a, a number of previous startups and you know working as a consultant for large financial institutions mainly like fortune 100 enterprises um, and the difference in between how they manage data and their ability to manage data was completely night and day uh, meaning in, in startup land, you know, I was analyzing data on a daily basis. Um, I was able to surface a feedback loop. I was able to determine what consumers liked and didn't like my consumer base. And I was able to improve that experience like on a daily basis. I think that, you know, the financial services industry amongst many other industries are going through that digital transformation. I just feel that fully, there are a lot of challenges to transitioning fully to the cloud, which I don't think is gonna happen overnight. And, and you know, that's one of the gaps that we sort of fill here. You can do this right now when you need it because digital adoption is something that most organizations haven't fully gotten right. Even the, the large ones still have a data lag and their an inability to respond to consumers when they need it. I think the other thing is, is as we sort of evolve creating defensibility around like just joining data and creating new data sets, including behavioral data, all of us starts allows us to develop new insights, which are proprietary to us. And those can be shared in aggregate across the market. So what benefits one financial institutions will benefit them all. And I think that those two things allow us to create a combination of defensibility, which allow us to differentiate, but also serve a, a need right now faster while they're going through this, you know, five to 10 year transition, maybe longer. Yeah, agreed. It's a transitional time. And I think it's all over the map. So we've, you know, we've spoken with small, medium and large and you know, bulk brackets, super largest uh, financial institutions. Um, and, and, it, and it's interesting how different their perspective on data and technology is in each of these institutions. Um, certainly the largest institutions have massive budgets for this type of investment. And I think we, we found uh, you know, defensibility and attractiveness to our solution is the ability to co collaborate. In fact, they have antitrust reasons why they can't collaborate. So they need to work through a kind of a clearinghouse or a kind of a consortium type of approach to benefit um, you know, across the industry. But I think as soon as you come below that top 10%, um, there's a massive shortage of this type of know-how and it's hard. Right? I think the simplest answer is it's hard. It's hard to get it right. And it's hard to get it right when you look at the, a single data point in perspective in terms of building out an algorithm on a, on a single institution and the ability to combine perspective, even not, not necessarily the data, but just the perspective across multiple institutions, that type of consultative uh, approach that Sarup mentioned, I think is, is critical to getting the stuff to work. Um, and I also feel that in our space, you know, there's 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 a, a lack of know-how and concern, uh, you know, from the, the kind of the the, the medium-sized institutions on the way down, um, and certainly as you kind of drop down that scale, you'll find it's it's an exponential scale, right? So the 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 the, the, the more behind an institution is, you know, the further behind they are in terms of being keeping up with with the biggest institutions, and making this type of technology available broadly across the industry is something that the regulators want to see, right? Because they you know, the, the biggest risks can come from the smallest institutions. And it used to be that uh, wiring money around the world, you know, would take, uh, you know, three days of mailing a letter and then three weeks of getting the letter back. Now it's instantaneous, right? Even the smallest institution can use, can move millions of dollars instantaneously. So the risk is actually around the small to medium-sized institutions. 
and uh, you know, piloting and, and defining this technology at the largest level and then making it available to the smaller institutions who don't have those types of budgets and, and wherewithal, I think is, is a great go-to-market capability because especially with the support of the regulators, you know, getting that type of tacit endorsement, being able to roll this out as a standardized way that everybody in the future should be using this technology will have massive benefit for the entire industry. Awesome. I would actually love to ask you some more questions and I'd love to continue this conversation, but I am cognizant of the time. I'm also cognizant of what else is going on in the world and in particular in the U.S. at this moment. So I want to just end here and ask you sort of what my favorite question is when, um, as I sort of have my investor hat on, which is like, what's your edge? If you had sort of one minute, you know, what would you tell me is your edge um, in this financial services space and in this fintech space? Um, it would be a great way to end. Sroop's nodding, so I'm going to ask him first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've already touched upon this, so, so I'll be quick. Um, it, it, what I get excited about is, and I, I mentioned this before, the minute we're able to join two data sets at the anonymous level, we were able to create new data. And I think creating new data and surfacing new insights is 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 the way to go. That's that's one of the areas to create defensibility. I'll give you an example. In the mortgage industry, we have a data set called LTV, a data point called LTV. LTV is just a combination of two other data sets, but that LTV data point is so valuable and everybody knows what that is. But that was just created out of two, three other data sets, uh, data points. You know, being able to engineer new features and create new data sets and surfacing that from a cosmetic standpoint to provide value to our end users, but also improve our models is something that makes me excited about every day that sort of pleases the engineer in me. What pleases the consumer in me, just being a banking customer, is understanding how what consumers want on a daily basis, how to improve those experiences, how to create those micro interactions that create more pleasurable experiences. And what makes me excited is we're able to do that at scale through financial institutions that have all the access to these customers, but need to do um, a little bit better in terms of serving them. And that that really like speaks to, to, to my heart and I me mean, as a consumer as well. Yeah, great. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be even briefer. And I'll say really there's three things that we have working for us. Um, our approach of scaling the analyst in instead of taking the big data approach. Um, getting the human in the loop and bringing human intelligence to the process. Um, the second piece is the sharing, the collaboration. So sharing the patterns of what fraud looked like, cyber fraud looked like, uh, and also once the known, the known fraudsters have been identified, sharing those identities in a uh, PII data privacy safe mechanism. And then the last piece is our support and engagement with government, learning from them what the industry is looking for and uh, essentially being able to work with them, I think is, is a real competitive advantage because um, it, re it made us really forefront in the industry uh, from the ability to be known as experts in the space, particularly around cyber fraud and threat intelligence. Um, so thank you. I, first of all, to Greg and Sarup, thank you. I learned so much and I am excited to sort of not only continue the dialogue with you, but watch you. I can imagine that in a year from now, um, and certainly four years from today, um, we will be in a completely different space in terms of the integration of fintech into financial services industries. And I'm really excited to see where you guys are and you know, see the growth of, of your businesses over the next several years. So um, thank you to the Lish Center and thank you for everyone for joining today. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>